Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to another edition of Crimes of the Week International. Authorities in the Russian city of Yekaterinburg say that they are investigating a former art gallery security guard this week after he was accused of bizarrely vandalizing a Soviet-era painting. According to reports, the incident was first uncovered sometime in December of last year, when a pair of visitors to the Yeltsin Center noticed something strange on a painting when walking through the art gallery. When they stopped to look at the painting called Three Figures, they noticed that the normally faceless characters in the artwork now appeared to have little eyes drawn on with ballpoint pen. Sensing something was wrong, the guests alerted employees at the gallery, who confirmed that the painting had been vandalized. An investigation revealed the alleged culprit. It was one of the security guards working who had ironically been paid to watch over the paintings. Though the guard's name has not yet been released at the time of this recording, representatives from the Yeltsin Center say that he was hired by a private security firm and that he has since been fired. Apparently, it was his first day on the job. While no definitive reason has been given as to why he drew the eyes on the painting, some reports allege that it happened because he was bored, while one of the gallery's curators attributed the bizarre act to, quote, some kind of lapse in sanity. Three Figures was painted in the 1930s by avant-garde artist Anna Leporskaya. It's unclear how much the painting is worth, however, reports state that it was insured for 74.9 million rubles, or roughly $1 million US. It's said that the painting has since been sent away for restoration, which is estimated to cost about $3,300. At the current time, the investigation into the security guard's alleged actions continue. Though if convicted of vandalism, local media says he could be looking at a fine and anywhere from three months to a year in prison. Authorities in the German state of Saxony-Anhalt say that they are investigating the man behind a viral video this week after he reportedly posted footage of himself driving more than 400 kilometers per hour on the country's Autobahn highway system. According to reports, the footage in question was filmed in July of last year by Czech millionaire Redeem Passer. The video allegedly shows Passer behind the wheel of his Bugatti Chiron driving down a stretch of the Autobahn 2 between the cities of Berlin and Hanover. In the footage, a speedometer is featured that shows the vehicle hitting speeds as high as 417 kilometers per hour, or roughly 260 miles per hour. Though the footage is from last summer, it reportedly wasn't posted online until earlier this year. However, when it was, it quickly captured the attention of members of the public, some of whom were angered enough by the stunt that they contacted police. While many of you are probably familiar with the fact that there is technically no speed limit on Germany's Autobahn system, authorities say that this doesn't give drivers permission to drive however they want. In this case, police say that Passer's stunt may constitute illegal solo road racing, which is punishable if a driver, quote, moves at an inappropriate speed, grossly contrary to traffic, and recklessly in order to reach the highest speed possible. On February 7th, representatives from the public prosecutor's office in the town of Stendal said that police had handed over their evidence in the case and that they were now conducting an investigation of their own. In his defense, Passer has so far claimed that when he carried out the stunt, there was visibility along the whole stretch where he was driving, and that safety was a priority. He also said that the footage was recorded at 4.50 a.m. on a Sunday morning. According to local media, if convicted of racing, Passer faces a prison sentence of up to two years, or an unspecified fine. Authorities in the South African province of Gauteng say that they are investigating the brutal murder of a healthcare worker this week after a nursing assistant was shot and killed outside of the hospital where she worked. According to reports, the situation unfolded on the morning of February 9th at the Tembisa Hospital. It began at approximately 8 a.m. when a 30-year-old police officer pulled into the parking lot and made a phone call. While everyone initially assumed that the officer was at the hospital on official business since he was driving his police cruiser and had his lights on, it turned out that his intentions were far more sinister. In reality, the officer had called his girlfriend, 30-year-old nursing assistant Lebo Monen, and told her to come and meet him. When Monen got to the parking lot, the two had a brief argument before the officer shot and killed her and then turned the gun on himself. Unfortunately, right now, few other details are available about the case. The name of the police officer allegedly responsible for the shooting has not been released. However, it's said that he is currently in critical condition at another hospital. 
At the time of this recording, Tembisa Hospital reportedly remains closed while police continue their investigation. Authorities in the Australian state of Queensland say that they have made four arrests this week in connection with the more than 13-year-old cold case murder of a 32-year-old father of two. According to reports, the case began all the way back on January 26, 2009, when Omega Rustin was driving home from some Australia Day celebrations with friends in the Gold Coast suburb of Burley Heads. At some point during the trip, Rustin was allegedly cut off in traffic by a group of men traveling in a maroon sedan, causing him to get angry and shout at them out the window. The argument escalated until both vehicles reportedly pulled off to the side of the road, and Rustin got out to confront the other men. However, as he was standing outside of his vehicle, investigators say that one of the men in the maroon sedan fired two shots at Rustin before speeding off. One of the shots hit Rustin in the stomach, and he died at the scene. Despite the best efforts of authorities to solve the murder at the time, the case went cold. It seems that few additional updates were provided to the public about the investigation, until out of nowhere this week, police announced that they had arrested four suspects in connection with the crime. The four men have since been identified as 39-year-old Tony Albea, 43-year-old Hysam Hamden, 37-year-old Paul Yunin, and 45-year-old Brent Luke Simpson. While two of the arrests seem to have been fairly straightforward, it said that the other two were a bit more noteworthy. Hamden was reportedly arrested while trying to board a flight to Dubai with $25,000 in cash, while Yunin, the suspected gunman in the crime, was captured after a police chase that allegedly reached speeds of up to 140 kilometers or 87 miles per hour. At the time of this recording, it's unclear exactly what prompted police to make these arrests after all this time. The only piece of evidence discussed in the reports we came across is that the gun allegedly used in the murder of Rustin was an exact ballistic match to another drive-by shooting at a Sydney tattoo parlor. While it appears that not all of the men have yet been formally charged, it's said that Albea has been charged with murder, accessory after the fact, corruption of a witness, and 30 counts of perjury. Simpson, meanwhile, has been charged with being an accessory, attempting to corrupt a witness, and 18 counts of perjury. It's said that all of the suspects have ties to either Middle Eastern organized crime groups or outlaw biker gangs. Authorities in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh say that they are investigating the murder of a 27-year-old woman this week after her body was found hidden in the water tank of her house. According to reports, the case began on February 4th when the mother of 27-year-old Rajni Masara tried to call her but found that her phone had been turned off. Thinking this was strange, she traveled to her daughter's house the following day but got no answer when she knocked on the door. Worried that something might have happened, the mother went around to the back of the residence where she was able to enter through another door. Once inside, she was horrified to find blood on the floor and called police. When investigators arrived, they conducted a thorough inspection of the property, eventually discovering Rajni's lifeless body in the home's water tank. It appeared that she had been stabbed to death. When police began to delve into the 27-year-old's personal life, they learned that she was supposed to be getting engaged just three days after her murder. They also discovered that she had been in a relationship with a man who was not her soon-to-be husband. Investigators now say they believe the unidentified lover is the prime suspect in Rajni's murder. The theory is that he committed the murder after learning of the 27-year-old's impending engagement. At the time of this recording, police are still searching for the man, whose name has not yet been released to the public. Authorities in the Swedish city of Vesteros say that they are searching for two unknown suspects this week, after they allegedly went into a local high school wielding knives and stole computers from students. According to reports, the incident took place at about 1.30 p.m. on February 7th, while students at the Rubikenska High School were in the middle of classes. Out of nowhere, two masked men appeared in one of the classrooms, threatening students with knives if they didn't hand over their computers. Witnesses say that the attack happened fast, and that the robbers shoved the stolen computers in bags that they had with them. Shortly after that, teachers chased the robbers from the school, forcing them to discard some of the stolen property. Though no teachers or students were injured as a result of the brazen crime, many were left understandably shaken by the incident, and the school was temporarily closed. 
It said that after the robbers fled the high school, they attempted to steal a car at Knife Point as well. Other bystanders intervened and reportedly managed to stop the carjacking. However, a man in his 40s was apparently beaten and injured by the robbers during the confrontation. At the time of this recording, the two robbers are still at large, and police are now asking for members of the public to come forward with any information they might have that could help to identify them. The situation is still under investigation. Authorities in the English county of East Sussex say that a man already accused of killing a 34-year-old mother is facing new allegations this week after investigators also charged him with the murder of a second woman. According to reports, 40-year-old Mark Brown was charged with the murder of 33-year-old Leah Ware on February 3rd, less than three months after he was arrested for killing 34-year-old Alexandra Morgan. The women, who both had roughly the same build, height, and hair color, went missing six months apart from one another last year. Neither woman's body has yet been found. While Alexandra was the second of the two women to go missing, hers was the first case to be linked to Mark Brown. Alexandra was last seen at around 7.20 a.m. on November 14th when she was fueling up her Mini Cooper at a gas station near her home in Kent. At the time, she allegedly told the cashier that she was going to meet someone, however, she failed to return home and was reported missing by her family. They became worried because it was unlike her not to stay in contact and she never would have abandoned her two children. Mark Brown was arrested for the murder 10 days later, shortly after Alexandra's car was recovered. Leah Ware was last seen sometime in May of last year near her home in East Sussex. Like Alexandra, Leah was known to stay in constant contact with family members, and they became concerned when they abruptly stopped hearing from her. At the time of this recording, it's unclear what evidence investigators have tying Mark Brown to both of the murders. While he has not yet entered a plea in Leah's case, he has so far tried to claim that Alexandra died in an accident and that he simply disposed of her body. Authorities in the Argentine city of Cordoba say that they have arrested five people this week in connection with the brutal murder of a local architect. According to reports, the case began on December 29th of last year, when 61-year-old Reynaldo Flair was found dead in his home. His sister had come to check up on him at his residence in the Los Bolivares neighborhood of the city after she had tried calling him several times but received no answer. The woman found Reynaldo dead on a chair in the dining room. His hands and feet had been bound with plastic zip ties, and he had been shot twice in the head at close range. When police investigated the scene further, they quickly ruled out robbery as a motive, since nothing from Reynaldo's house appeared to be missing. Neighbors hadn't heard anything out of the ordinary at the house the previous night. The police concluded, based on footprints left at the scene, that multiple people had to have been involved. They suspected that the culprits had either entered the house after Reynaldo got home that night, or else found their way in beforehand and waited for him to arrive. In either case, there were no signs of forced entry. Investigators also suspected that the killers had turned up the television on full blast to drown out the sounds of any yells or gunshots. All signs pointed to the crime being meticulously planned and organized. With all of these details, investigators turned their attention to those close to Reynaldo. Based on undisclosed evidence found at the scene, as well as footage taken from nearby cameras, police were able to uncover and arrest five suspects this week. Those suspects have since been identified as Reynaldo's own daughter Irina and her husband Leandro Mascarello, as well as three other men named David Silvestre, Samuel Mascarello, and David Suarez. At the time of this recording, it remains unclear exactly what the motive behind the crime was. However, local media reports heavily imply that money had something to do with it. It said that Reynaldo was fairly wealthy and that he also owned land. That brings us to the end of this edition of Crimes of the Week International. If you're a fan of the new series, don't forget to tell us in the comment section below. While you're there, make sure to subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.